Thank you for that wonderful reminder. I always said that God accepts us as we are, but he loves us too much to leave us there, right? He's in the life-changing business, and I'm so thankful for that. Would you bow your heads with me? Gracious Father in heaven, I've got some things prepared up here, and as you do sometimes, you change things up. But Lord, most of all, I pray today that you would take things over. Use me, I pray, and speak to us, your people, in Jesus' name, amen. I did a lot of driving in my previous job. Both Rochelle and I did. We worked for the Upper Columbia Conference in uh, director and associate director jobs and that took us everywhere. And Upper Columbia was a large conference. Uh, in fact, the, the slide that you're seeing, I believe is 390, well, it's part of 395, this is only two lanes, but this is your typical view driving through the Palouse in, uh, on, I think, 195 in Eastern Washington. You know, a lot of people think, oh, you live in Washington. Oh, how do you stand the weather? It rains all the time. No, we were on the other side of the state. And this is what it looked like, especially going through the Palouse. And boy, when it's green, and it's green everywhere, it's beautiful. But mile after mile after mile, Rochelle would sometimes get done with work uh, in like some school meeting way down in Goldendale and she'd drive four and a half hours home and get home at 12 at night, 12.30. And uh, my job was similar, although I tried to avoid the late night drives. But one of the things I really came to appreciate during that time, those times in the car, were cell phones. Uh, my mobile phone was my friend. Now, I'm not someone who's attached to my mobile phone all the time. In fact, maybe even some of you have gotten frustrated that after you do some texting or you call, I don't get back to you like in two minutes. Uh, I know some of our young folks, they text somebody and if they're like, they wait for the response. Don't ever text me and wait because it might be a while. But uh, I really began to appreciate cell phones also for the purpose of being able to um, get some work done when you're in the car. You can call this person or that person and get a few things going. And so that was something that I really, really appreciate. It got me thinking back to when my friends and I were growing up, how in the world did we ever stay in touch? I, I, I mean, I really had to think, how did we plan events and go somewhere and not get lost from each other? Because the way that things work today, you don't get lost because you have your cell phone, right? But I think what we would do is we would call, leave a message, wait till that night, finally get a call back from a friend, say, what are we doing Saturday night? And then you'd hook up, you know, get together Saturday night and you'd go out and you'd do something and you'd hope that you weren't gonna get separated. <laughs> But I'll tell you what, we are living in a new age, uh, the cell phone age, the connected age. And uh, I, I, I was a member, in fact, when I use this phrase, can you hear me now, what immediately comes to mind? Verizon, right? Uh, we did, uh, and we still have Verizon as our cell phone uh, provider, partly because in Eastern Washington, AT&T and most of the other uh, service companies would have dead spots all over the eastern side of the state, and so you'd lose coverage. Verizon didn't. You could pretty much stay connected the whole time. And that was one of the things that Verizon took on as part of its mission. In 2002, it launched a campaign, campaign which we then get uh, received that Can You Hear Me Now slogan from. And the mission was to enable people and businesses to communicate with each other. And the simple question, can you hear me now, move network reliability up the ranks as the key purchase consideration when it came to buying a cell phone. If you wanted to not have drop calls, if you wanted connectivity and not to lose somebody, Verizon was advertising, we are your carrier. And it did prove, for the most part, true in our situation as well. 
But I'm here to say that in our walk with Jesus, I also believe that it is vital that our line of communication is open and working all the time. That there aren't any moments, any gaps where we can't hear Jesus leading us. That no matter what comes our way, no matter what decision we're facing, the challenge that we face, we can depend upon Jesus to speak into our lives his will and follow it. There is so much noise, though, that competes for our attention today. More than ever before. Add to that the busyness of life And it gets very difficult at times to be constantly mindful that God is there, that his spirit resides in us and that Jesus wants to speak to us and lead us throughout the day. We need to make sure that we can hear God's voice clearly and distinctly through all of the interference. And there is so much interference. It's interesting that God's first question to Adam and Eve after they fell, after they fell into sin, was, who told you that you were naked? Now, I don't just read that for the exact words that it says. What I'm hearing God say is, who have you been listening to? Who's been telling you things that aren't what I told you? Who told you that you were naked? You see, God was asking them who they had been listening to. But more than that, I think that same question we should ask ourselves today is who are we listening to throughout our life and especially our life right now? The voice of the enemy is very deceptive And he's always looking for ways to distract us from the voice of the one who loves us and has given his life for us. You see, at any given moment, we're either, we're tuned into one of three different channels, okay? The first one is God. You can be tuned into God all the time. Believe me, it, it, it can happen, it does happen. That's part of our growth and our walk with him is that we begin to open up and realize that he's there with us all the time. But there's another channel that tries to run interference. You might call it a hostile channel. And that channel is Satan, the arch enemy. So he also has a channel and he's trying to connect in and feed you and deceive and mislead. Of course, he's a liar. He has been from the very beginning. But yet it's so easy to begin to listen to that channel because you know what? Your body, your body is in its fallen state is hardwired to do so. So most of the world is tuned in to that channel, sad to say. Now, it would be easy for me to say to you right now that, well, you're either tuned into God or you're tuned into Satan, but that's actually not quite true. It's not the only channel. There's a third channel. And that channel is your nature, your own desires. I was talking to a lady in a former church who was really giving um, a hard time. He's really presenting a challenge for that church. And I kept hearing about it from members, so I decided to go and talk with her. Um, She kind of gave herself to to telling people the truth about the truth, you know. She was, she'd given herself, some would say, to the perfecting of the saints. And so I, I decided to go over to her house and we sat down and I was talking with her a little bit about this and, and trying to encourage her that what she was doing was not God's plan. It wasn't God leading her to do. Even though she was convinced God was telling her to speak to people in certain ways that were very unproductive and not spiritually uplifting. (laughs) And she said to me, she said, well, well, wait a minute, pastor. Are you saying that I'm listening to the devil? Is that what you're telling me? Because you know what? If I'm not listening to God, 
I must be listening to the devil. And it's one of those moments in, in, in pastoral counseling where you pray for the answer and it comes very quickly. And I was praying and I heard very distinctly these words. She's listening to herself. She's fully convinced in her own mind that what she's doing is God's leading. So it is absolutely true that sometimes our own desires, our own wishes can almost compel us to think that we're hearing from God or even from the enemy. So I do caution you in this one thing that whenever the voice is loud and clear, at least you think, make sure you test it in the light of scripture. Is this something God would have me to say or to do? Because it may not be God, and it may not be the enemy, it may be but what you want to happen. It's not as simple as the devil on one shoulder and an angel on the other, right? We've all seen those pictures. Our own nature and our own desires cry out to us and they call for fulfillment. You know, that's what pleasure is all about, right? Fulfilling the fallen nature, kind of, I'm not talking about all pleasure, but just when we have this insatiable desire to just go from one satis you know, thing to be satisfied with to another, it's that flesh that is saying, feed me, feed me. And all the while the Lord says, let me in, let me in. In Jesus' day, there was much conversation about who he was. And there were always people kind of tagging along to try and trap him in something that he said. In our scripture reading for today, it was one of those occasions. There were Jews, there were leaders of the Jews that were very close by and they engaged him in a conversation saying to him, how long do you keep us in doubt? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. Jesus' opposers wanted to use his words against him. They didn't care about what he said or what he taught unless they could use those words to destroy him. Jesus answered them, I told you, and you did not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me. You do not believe because you are not of my sheep. As I said to you, verse 27, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. If you read a little bit on in that chapter, just not too many verses down, five or six verses, they picked up stones to throw at him. Because although he didn't make the direct statement, I am the Messiah, they inferred with his words that he was, in fact, revealing such, and he did. But I want us to note in these words, these last words from Jesus in this passage, that following Jesus is to live in the way that he has taught us to live. That is how we testify that we have actually heard his voice. Now, one of the amazing things about this word hear, when Jesus uses it, is it's not just, just hearing some sound. It's, it's an active hearing. It's a, it's a hearing that, that brings about a response that confirms that one has heard. In fact, elsewhere he says, if you hear me, but you do not do, you don't follow the things that I teach you, then you're not really one of mine. And that's what he's saying essentially here. So we have always believed that it's not just believing that Jesus is God, it's, it's what we do with our life in response to that belief that really confirms our followership, followership, if I can use that word, of Christ. But I wanna say this, there should be more fear that we will not hear the Lord 
then he will not hear us. I've talked to many who are fearful that God no longer hears them. And my, my counsel in those situations would be, if you're afraid you, that God is not hearing you, redirect your fear a little bit that you might not be hearing God. So today we want to spend some time on how we can hear God's voice. And I'm going to give you five ways that he speaks to us, but I'm not going to do that yet. We're going, to, we're going to build some groundwork here first. Because there is a difference between hearing and listening. Did you know that? It doesn't come through so clearly in, in Scripture as far as the, the, the word hear it tends to be listening is what Jesus is talking about. But there are definitely distinctive differences between hearing and listening. Hearing is simply the act of perceiving sound by the ear. In communication, hearing is passive in that it gives little attention to learning the intended meaning of the words. In other words, you can be talking with somebody and you can be hearing what they're saying, but you're not listening. I've gotten in trouble doing that before. Um, and in fact, Rochelle has said sometimes, I told you that, you didn't hear what I was saying. And we've gotten it down to the point where we figured this out if I'm distracted, it's hard for me to concentrate and to listen to what she's saying. So we, we've got this thing worked out where she breaks my concentration on whatever I'm doing, and then she communicates to me. Okay, now, wives, are you frustrated at all that your husbands don't listen to you sometimes? Okay, so let me give you a quick little tip here. So whatever they're doing, say, honey, can, can, you, can you pay attention to me for a minute? I need to tell you something important. Or I need to say something. I really need you to hear this. Break their attention. And then say what you got to say. And I promise you will become much more efficient in communicating what you want to communicate. Uh, Rochelle and I used to have a conversation, well, sometimes I feel like when you don't listen, that you just don't really care. I'm like, well, that's not really, that's kind of far from the truth. It's not that I care, I'm paying attention to something else. I'm not a multitasker. And uh, in fact, I have, to, I have to give Pastor Melanie's some props for that. She said to me a couple weeks ago, she said, Pastor John, I have learned one thing about you. You're not a multitasker. And of course, Mark was also in the room and she, she kind of said, Mark, you too. <laughs> you see, I think sometimes this is a man and woman thing. Yes. Women are just better at multitasking than most men are. I'm not saying it's a carte blanche, you know, blanket statement, but it typically is the case. So you can have a lot more peace, you can communicate a lot more effectively if you break our attention, ladies, and then we're listening. You can speak what you want to communicate. So what is listening then? Listening is active and requires cognitive effort. You've got to put your mind to it. It's something you consciously choose to do. Listening engages the brain to concentrate on the meaning of words and sentences and then processes them for reflective response. And some call listening, this kind of listening, active listening, whatever you want to, to choose to, to describe it. Life, I believe, can be so much more rewarded, rewarding that when we are active listeners. When we engage in conversation and we talk with each other that we're actually engaging the mind and we're thinking and we're focusing on what someone is trying to communicate to us. One of the things that tries to, I try to remember 
is that as an individual, I don't speak to people. I speak with people. Do you see the difference? That when we have a conversation, I'm trying to engage in, in communication that is both ways. I'm not trying to just think of the next thing I'm going to say as they're talking. Which is often what happens in communication. And I would say, especially when there's a crucial conversation happening and you want to get a point across, it's so easy to fall into the trap of thinking about what you want to communicate next rather than actually listening and trying to understand what a person is saying. Sociologist Charles Derber describes the desire to take over a conversation, to do most of the talking, and to turn the focus of the exchange on one's ideas as conversational narcissism. Conversational narcissism. I found that an interesting term. It's subtle and unconscious. Derber also believes that it is the key manifestation of the dominant attention-getting psychology in America today. Have you been paying attention to how the left, I'm talking about political left and political right, are, are trying to communicate but have no effective, no results anymore? They just keep saying what they're saying from both sides and no one's listening at all. They're just trying to figure out the next thing to up the ante to swing people to their side. And it's not working, friends. It used to be that two sides that are opposed maybe in views and perspectives could come together and they could figure out some middle ground whereby they can move forward then with some understanding. But today, I just don't see a lot of that happening. And I believe that is a sign of some conversational narcissism that's happening right in front of us. But God wants it to be different with his people. He wants us as a family to, to talk to each other, to, to, to when we communicate, to, to truly seek to understand where one is coming from, to enter into their shoes, to be even empathetic when the conversation is intense and you can tell that they are really wrapped up and concerned with what they have to share. This is what Paul, the Apostle Paul says to the church in Philippi. Therefore, if there is any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and mercy, Fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. Let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus. Jesus made his trip to this earth all about you. He was consumed with how he was going to get you into his kingdom. That was his every thought. That was his goal every day. And as he looked to touch the lives of people, he was always doing it to bring care and concern to the one that is in need. And friends, we don't have a budget in this church to, to feed 10,000 people a week. And I'll tell you, if you don't think there's 10,000 homeless people in Phoenix, the number's north of that. We don't have enough money to just engage in that problem and feed everybody. But you know what? We do have the love of Christ in here. And he wants us to connect with them, to feel where they're, from, they're coming from, 
and to do what we can to meet a need. And we cannot do that unless we are listening for God's leading in our lives. Listening is an unselfish undertaking. It is other-centered. And by listening, we care about a person's need to be understood. This is the outworking of a mind transformed by the Holy Spirit, yet we still must learn how to do it. And that takes practice. It's interesting, at the end of each letter to the seven churches, Jesus asks, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. In the case of Laodicea, the, he adds here that you say, da, 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 da. And then he says, but I say, counsel me and buy from me. What I get from that is, as Laodicea, we've done well doing a lot of talking. We're good talkers. But God wants us to be even better listeners. What are your relationships like? Are you spending time when you communicate with others, listening and trying to understand what they're saying to your spouse, with your kids? You see, this is the mind of Christ. It is focused on the other, not just your need to be heard. Lou Holtz, the head football coach from Notre Dame for many, many years, said these words, life is 10% what happens to you and 90% how you respond to it. Life is 10% what happens to you and 90% how you respond to it. In a book titled Congregational Leadership in Anxious Times, Peter Steinke points to studies that show how most people in the world respond to anxiety and conflict, stressful situations. He notes that the majority of people have an automatic reaction that is triggered by some stressful event. Whereas very few are able to step back, listen reflectively, and then respond accordingly. Automatic reactions are triggered with differences or disagreements over belief or opinion. And these reactive behaviors are driven by a set of predetermined ideas and conclusions, which usually involve judgments and stereotypes. Friends, I think one of, the, one of the worst things that we do, I, 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 let me just speak openly here. That social media is, is, is okay, it's a, it's, a, it's a neat thing to check out on some things, but I'll tell you what, it's killing us. People are free to just say whatever they wanna say. And they do it without having to face somebody. If you look at some of these threads, people can be terrible in what they say about others. But here's what I'm trying to say about this, is that we tend to immerse ourselves into uh, streams or stories or things going on in social media with people that agree with what we believe. Rather than true learning, which takes place out of what we already think we know and tries to learn from somebody else. Let, let's bring this down to spiritual, the essence of spirituality. God's ways are not our ways. And unless we're learning to step out of our paradigm of life and what we're used to doing, we're never going to learn his ways. So the very same thing that we see happening in society actually can tend to happen with us unless we are opening, open to hearing God's voice and letting him lead. Friends, I, I have struggled many times, especially as a young man, just trying to figure out what God wants me to do. Uh, my wife Rochelle at times will say, I wish God would just write it on the wall. 
You know, the only time God wrote on the wall in the Bible, it wasn't good. <laughs> but I think if, if he were to write it on the wall, we, we wouldn't be able to exercise faith because we would know what's going to happen. You, you see, faith is the opposite of absolute knowledge. And if he were to write every morning for you on the wall what you should do that day, there would be no faith. You would just do it, and the day would be over, and you could say, God, your will be done. What kind of a life is that? To me, the life of faith is beautiful. We can trust that God knows what's best for us, and he will handle things in his due time because he loves us and because he gave his life for us. Amen? So how can we avoid these instant automatic reactions to something we hear, some stressful situation? You know, a conversation that someone has and we don't like what we just heard from them. Instead of snapping right back and making sure that we're heard, how can we get out of that mode? How can we truly communicate in the way that God wants us to communicate with other people? And I would say in a way that God wants to communicate with us. Let me give you a few things that might help you in this area. I found it to help me. First of all, realize that you are prone to automatic reactions. You are preconditioned to react. And only the Spirit of God can help move you out of that mode. So you are prone to it. Recognize that. The second thing is, acknowledge that you may not be correct in your opinion. There is a chance that you may be completely inaccurate in the conclusion you have arrived at. Another one, practice active listening. During this step, seek clarification and affirm agreement with somebody else. In other words, look to understand what they're telling you, and when they make points that you agree with, step in, interject, and show agreement. Also, you could, after or later in the conversation, Begin to test in your mind what you've heard so that you can start to formulate a response. This is a reflective response, a thoughtful response, not an automatic reactive response. But make sure you do that in light of Scripture and God's will for your life. And lastly, I would encourage you to use words of love and respect, especially on points of disagreement. You see, we're not tested, our character isn't tested when we're not challenged. Our character is not tested when everything's going just great. Our character is tested when someone rubs us the wrong way. And that's why I'm giving you these things, because these, I think some of these things can help us become more like Jesus in how he communicated and interacted with others. So now we've gotten to the five ways God speaks to us. Because you know what, if we don't know how God speaks to us, then how can we hear his voice and be led by him, right? What we're talking about here, like with this list and how we can better connect with others and hear what their need is, especially the need to be heard, we do that because we, we can engage in that process because the Holy Spirit is speaking to us and revealing that as we go. How many times have you been in a conversation that is intense and you've asked the Lord to give you wisdom and he does? and you're able to just calm down or speak some words that bring calmness to the situation. You see, if we can't hear that voice, we're in trouble. Because in every way, as I read God's word, God says he is trying to speak to you and he's trying to do it all the time. We used to get fearful of that. God told me, oh, what are they saying? God told you, how did he do that? Let me give you five ways he speaks to you. And then you might be able to be better equipped to listen for his voice. 
God's word, the Bible, is the first way he speaks to us. This word is living and powerful. When you read it, God is talking to you. And so as you peruse its words, don't think of them as just literature. Think of them as God's voice to you. And if you're not spending time in the word, you're limiting God's voice. You've got to spend time in the word of God every day. Uh, One pastor friend of mine said, well, the word of God is how God speaks to us. Prayer is how we speak back to God. So you can actually read the word of God in a prayerful way. Uh, Some even advocate going into the Psalms and in Isaiah and pray the words of scripture. That's a beautiful way to interact with God and to communicate with him. Paul says in Romans 10, 17, that that faith comes by hearing and hearing by what? The word of God. We hear through the word of God. Number two, God speaks to us through thoughts, impressions. I mean, we can't necessarily explain it, but do you ever just have a thought pop into your head and you know God is trying to tell you something? I've had that happen many, many times. But if I'm not aware or ready for that to happen, I won't know what it is. I'll think, well, is that just me? (laughs) But as you understand and you pray and you read the word, God will then begin to speak throughout the day through thoughts and impressions as he leads you in life. Isaiah 30 verse 21 says, your ears shall hear a word behind you saying, this is the way, walk in it whenever you turn to the right hand or whenever you turn to the left. This is God's guiding voice through your life. He's not speaking out loud, but he's speaking to your mind and you can hear it. Another way he speaks to you is through dreams and visions. Now I'm not suggesting here that everybody's gonna have a vision. Nor am I suggesting here that every dream is God's voice. That's not what I'm saying. But we do find in his word that over and over again, God has used dreams or visions to speak to his people. Do you know that this is one of the significant new, um, I should, new developments, maybe that's not the right word exactly, but one of the new things we're hearing coming out of the Muslim world is that they are starting to report that Jesus is appearing to people in dreams. And in fact, I think I have I have a statement here. Yeah, from Adventist Frontier Missions, they report that Jesus is appearing to Muslims all around the world in dreams and visions, inviting them to follow him. And this is coming from Adventist Frontier Missions who are receiving requests to get to know about Jesus and his teachings. And they're reporting that Jesus appeared to me in a dream or a vision. So God still does that. Joel 2, Joel 2, 28 tells us this, and it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. You see, God is gonna do this again. There will come a time where he will be speaking through dreams and visions more actively than we traditionally see him today. So be ready for that. In other words, he, in other times, the ways he speaks to us is through audible words. Now, I'm not saying necessarily it's the voice of God audibly, you know, talking from heaven. What I'm saying here is that he will send angels, maybe, to impersonate a person and speak. He might send a friend who speaks truth into your life. As a preacher, I stand up every Sabbath and I try to speak and share the word of God. And he, God uses these audible ways of receiving to speak to his people. There was a, some friends of ours that told us this story. They were driving their car. How many of you lived in Angwin for any bit of a time? Angwin, California, okay. 
If you, do you remember Brookside Way? Real tight, narrow street? Okay, they were on Brookside, Joanne, since you seem to be the only one here with me that had lived in Angwin. They were on Brookside, and he was driving along with his wife by his side, and he heard her say, Honey, pull over the car now and stop. And he, he pulled the car over and he stopped. And right when he stopped, a car came flying down the middle of the road the other direction and would have hit him head on, going way too fast on a very small, narrow road. And he said to her, Boy, honey, I'm so glad you said something when you did because I had, I, I had you know the car was up there. Did I just, oh, there we go. How did you know that car was coming? And she said, what are you talking about? She, he said, you told me. You said out loud, very loud, turn, pull, pull over the car now and stop. She says, I didn't say a word. I wondered why you pulled over. So don't tell me that God doesn't send a messenger. Remember, angel means messengers to give messages when he needs us to hear them, because he does. Psalm 9111, for he shall give his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways. And the last way I would like to, to, to share here with you today that God speaks to us is through life's circumstances. This is one of the more difficult things because it can be a challenge to see where God is leading sometimes in our lives, but he does use circumstances in life to speak to us and to guide and direct our path. Sure, there are some coincidences, but also we need to, lead, to, to leave open the door to see God leading in, in some of these apparent coincidences. I think sometimes we don't see him because we're not looking for him either. But I can tell you without a doubt that when you invited Rochelle and I to come take a look at this church last, early last year to potentially come and serve as, as the pastor, senior pastor here, that we, from that moment of starting our to plan our trip and to come down here, from that moment, we began to put our lenses on for God's cir using circumstances and situations. We were looking to see if he was going to open doors or if he was going to close them. He does open and he does close doors. So as we began to do that, we saw nothing but confirmation after confirmation of open doors, an open path. Now, if you go back to, to December of 2015, we were invited as well back then to come and take a look at this church. And we had our same lenses on, and guess what happened? Boom, boom, closed door after closed door. God reveals his will even through life's circumstances and situations that we go through. We have to make sure that we're seeing it through the lens that God has given us. And of course, his word and through prayer, asking him to open and close those doors as he sees fit. I read from Esther chapter 4, verse 13. Mordecai told them to answer Esther. Esther went back and said, Mordecai, I hear that you're asking me to do something to go before the king. I might die. Something might happen. And so Mordecai sends this message back to Esther. Do not think in your heart that you will escape in the king's palace any more than all the other Jews. For if you remain completely silent at this time, relief and deliverance will arise for the Jews from another place. But you and your father's house will perish. Yet who knows whether you have come to the king, kingdom for such a time as this. No one will read the book of Esther and deny that God isn't all, his fingers aren't all through it. You can see his hand leading all throughout the book of Esther. But do you realize that not once in the entire book does it mention God? 
God is not mentioned once in the book of Esther. But you see in the story, God clearly leading in Mordecai and Esther's life and the life of the Jews at that time. My friends, I want to encourage you to open your ears and to begin to listen for God's voice. It doesn't happen in one way. One way doesn't fit all people. But what he wants most of all is he wants us to at least tune our ears to him to make sure that channel of communication is open. And he wants it to be open every moment of every day. And that's what Paul, the apostle Paul had in mind when he said, pray without ceasing. Be in an attitude of prayer all the time. Ask the Lord to lead you. And in your conversations with others, become a listener. Seek to know where someone's coming from. Allow the Holy Spirit to guide your thoughts and your words and your actions as you engage and converse with others. I think it's so important because we live in a day that the world is simply not doing it. And let me tell you, if you approach somebody in a different way, in a kinder, more thoughtful, caring way, they will see Jesus in you. They will know that Jesus somehow has got a hold of your life and you will have a testimony to bear that God has spoken and you have heard. Jesus instructs us. He uses one word for this attitude of prayer, this attitude of hearing God's voice. That word is abide. Abide. If you abide in me, I will abide in you. It's a promise. Abiding is a constant awareness of Christ's presence in your life. And this is the experience he wants each of you to have. From Medical Ministry, page 213, we read, If we will keep the heart and mind open heavenward, cherishing the comfort of his grace in the heart, the presence of Christ will be revealed. Friends, I want to challenge you today to seek the Lord in the morning through prayer and the reading of his word. Don't let the devil get you so busy to try and open that other channel of communication to the point where you become closed off to God's leading. But seek his face every morning through prayer and his word. And then throughout the day, nurture an awareness of his abiding presence. Abide in Jesus, but in conscious effort, do this. I'm talking about not just, oh, pray, I want to pray, Lord. Uh, I want to abide in your presence, so please help that to happen. You know, sometimes I think it's good to set an alarm. An alarm that goes off like once every hour. And when you hear the alarm, you go, oh, that's right. The Lord is here. I used to pray for reminders. I used to say, Lord, I've been forgetting you lately. I need you to remind me that you're there. And I can't tell you how many times throughout my days he would say, I'm here. He would remind me that he's there, just because I asked. So ask him for reminders too. And then walk with him throughout the day. In the evening, recall how Jesus has been with you throughout the day. In the morning, you may have thanked him or, or, or asked him to be with you, to help you. In the evening, Thank him for how he has helped you. Friends, this is the practical experience that I want you to have with Jesus in your walk with him each and every day. And I would love to hear your testimonies of the, how this has changed your life. Please let me know how that's going. Sometimes your pastors preach and we don't know the results. Let us know how it's going. But I will end with this. When God asks the question, as he always does, can you hear me now? Be ready to answer loud and clear. And then his grace will be with you. Your life will be transformed. And you'll be exactly where he wants you to be as you await his return. 
Would you pray with me? Father in heaven, we as your people are weak and we need your strength. And you promise that, that we, when we are weak, you are strong. And so, Father, we give ourselves to you and we pray specifically today that you would break that channel of communication that the enemy is trying to use to, gain, to, to bring interference into our lives. To break him and his success in those endeavors. We know, each of us, where he has success in our lives. Father, break that channel of communication. Rewire us and help us to have our ears on, to hear your voice clearly and distinctly, and then to respond immediately as you have said that those who hear your voice and follow you are your sheep. Lord, we want to be your sheep. So Father, we give ourselves to you. We pray for strength, but we pray for your help by the power of your grace that we'd see the reality, the fruition of these promises that are so prevalent that you will never leave us or forsake us, but you will never leave us where we are at spiritually either. Lord, change us again today. Renew us in your grace, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you all.